We're in chapter 8, and if you're in the book, it's on page 34. And if you're looking at the screen, I'm going to pop it up onto the screen in just a, in just a moment. The theme at this point in time is we started in the first five chapters, we spoke about the Nefesh kiss, the godly soul, and about holiness, Kedusha, how we connect to Hashem in a meaningful way, so on and so forth. Chapter 6 shifted us to the world of the opposite, the reality of Kripa, the possibility of something which is, in, an, an, is antith antithetical to Judaism, s interferes with godliness, doesn't allow Hashem to manifest in the world, and we spoke about the fact that there are actually two possibilities. There's what we call Kripas Noiga and there's what we call regular Kripos. And Kripas Noiga is the one that's kind of friendly. We could do something uh, meaningful with it. That is anything in the world that does not have a predefined -def reality of holiness, or for that matter, a predefined reality of being antithetical to holiness. So the way that we behave, the, what we do with it, that's going to determine if in fact it is an elevated or a a downgraded experience. So the classic example, I know we keep going back to the same example again and again, the classic example that we use is the example of food, food that is kosher. Kosher really just simply means that this food is now usable and it may in fact be upgraded. doesn't mean that it's automatically upgraded, but if we use the right intentions and we focus and we eat in the way that we should, that will have a transformative effect on the food and it will no longer just be ordinary. It will actually become something which is, which is meaningful and, and holy. Then the, uh, the other side of the coin is that we spoke about klippas, proper klippa, something which is real klippa, something which is absolutely antithetical to Judaism, and it has no redeeming qualities. So if a person engages with that, let's again use the example of food, non-kosher food. So not only will the person not be in a position that they could elevate the food, but to the contrary, it's actually going to schlep, drag them down into the world of impurity. That was all what we sp spoke about in chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 8 started off by telling us that you could land up being involved in things which are contrary to the Torah in a way that has all the best intentions. So here's somebody who wants to learn and they want to daven and they want to use the energy that is installed within the food. They want to use it in a positive way. And this is going to elevate themselves. Amazing. But the food's not kosher. Well, you can have all the great intentions in the world. It's not going to help. It's like the person who is trying to launch themselves with a hot air balloon at the same time that they have a ball and chain around their leg. So you can have all the hot air balloons in the world. You're not going to go anywhere because the ballast, the, the ball and chain is just simply too heavy and it's going to drag a person down. So the same thing happens when something is considered non-kosher. The expression that we use is that it's asur. Asur means that it is chained, that it is bound, it's stuck in this world and all the great intentions and even if you use that energy in the most positive way possible and uh, and there's the, you know, there's there's uh, all the good intentions, it, it still doesn't help. Then we got into a different conversation. That's where we are now. And this is where things are starting to become a little bit more intriguing for us. Not just interesting for us, but intriguing for us. And that is, what about things that are a little bit less tangible, a little bit less tactile, a little bit less material than food? as an example. What happens if we're talking about conversations? What happens if we talk about how a person spends their time? Things that are a little bit more nebulous. How does that affect the individual and their spirituality? So, what we've learned so far, and in this conversation, by the way, we're going to get to what it is that we're going to talk about today, which is the things that happen in the soul's journey beyond life. So, What's, what's part of the soul's journey beyond life? All the various things that a soul has to undergo in order to shed, in order to cleanse, in order to remove what is possibly negative in the soul's experience. So, we started off by talking about Devarim Betelem. And this is going to get to be a lot of fun because, of course, everybody wants to hear that the things that they talk about could actually be spiritually damaging. That's exactly what we were waiting to hear. Because, you know, it's not, it's, it's not bad enough that if a person speaks losh and horror negatively about somebody else, that's obviously a transgression according to Torah. Obviously, because you're not allowed to speak negatively about somebody else. That goes without saying. And obviously, if a person speaks falsehood, we understand that that is something which is absolutely contrary to Torah and there's no way that that could be acceptable. But Devarim Batalim, Devarim Batalim is ordinary conversation. Ordinary conversation means things like, uh, you know, what's happening, the news, politics, I don't know, whatever the things are that people speak about. What do people speak about? Submarines, 
they speak about uh, artificial intelligence. I don't know what it is that people speak about. Devarim Betelin. What does Devarim Betelin mean? It doesn't have any holy value. That's, that's Devarim Betelin. So we learned last time that if a person engages in Devarim Betelin, even if they are not a Torah scholar, which means they don't really have the opportunity to speak about something else, so what happens to them is their soul, after they enter the next world, has to experience something that is called Kaf HaKela. Okay, that's where we got up to last time. La, kaf HaKela, we said, is some kind of a slingshot experience where the Neshama is, is uh, jettisoned back and forth between different realities. And let's put it this way. Do you remember, or maybe you don't remember, or maybe you've never had this experience. Once upon a time, what people used to do is if they had to clean a rug in their house, they would take the rug outside, they would suspend the rug on a clothesline or something like that. And then they would take some kind of a swat and they would whack. Yes, you know this experience? They would whack the rug repeatedly again and again. Smack and smack, right? That, that's how they would clean the rug of the dust. So I'd like to ask you if it was, I mean, rugs obviously collect dust because they're at the bottom of the room. And obviously gravity will bring anything that is floating around in the room to the floor. So it's going to land up being stuff which is on the rug itself. And besides that, people walk. You know, you walk into the house with all the best intentions. Everybody has their method of doormats and telling people to take off their shoes and whatever other method you come up with. The reality is there'll always be dust on a rug. So you take the rug outside, you give it a few claps, and you get rid of the, of the dust. It's amazing, right? What would happen if somebody would spill some item on the rug and it would leave a stain. Now you've got a rug with a stain on it. Will it help to take it outside, suspend it on the clothesline, and start to clap it? No. You could, you could schmice, as we say in Yiddish. You, know, you, could, you could hit it again and again and again, as many times as you wish. It's not going to help for the stain. So how do you get rid of the stain? How do you do it? What's the secret of getting rid of a stain? Well, there are a few methods that you could use. The one method is you're going to have to take stain remover and you're going to have to take a brush, a scrubbing brush, and then you're going to get down on hands and knees and start scrubbing away and schwitzing away to get rid of the stain. Or, alternatively, what you could do is you could put it through a heated wash cycle in some kind of a specialized washing machine or maybe use dry cleaning. You'll apply some kind of heat or maybe you've got one of those steam cleaners. Do you have one of those, you know, those high pressure steam cleaners? You come along and psh, you give it a big, uh, you know, a big push and a big uh, spritz and then hopefully between the heat and the pressure, the stain will come out. The very fact that a soul could undergo what is called kafakela. And that would be a means of cleansing the soul. When you picture in your mind what this kafakela, this slingshot experience is like, you recognize that it is similar to the idea of beating the rug to get rid of the dust. Because that's what happens when you throw something from one part to the other. Let's just say for argument's sake you had just a ball, a regular ball, and you throw the ball from one person to the other person, if there would be anything that had collected on the outside of the ball, from the friction of being thrown and caught and thrown and caught, it will have a sa the same effect as hitting the rug, you'll get rid of the dust. So here you've got a person, Tanya described the possibility of a person who is an Am Haaretz. Right? Remember what an Am Haaretz is? An Am Haaretz is somebody who is considered ignorant, so we don't expect much of them, unfortunately. And an Am Haaretz is a person who is of the earth, a very materialistic kind of, or grounded kind of, salt of the earth person. We don't expect sophistication. We don't expect that they're going to have some kind of deep, meaningful experience of holiness. You know, it's an Am Haaretz. They, what, 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 you know, what do they engage with? What do they know? What do they, they understand? So this person is going to speak me meaningless things because this person is not filled with content. So that is going to affect their soul as if it was like a collection, like a film of dust that, fo that formed on the outside of the soul because of this meaningless prattle. And when their neshama gets cast about in heaven, that unnerving agitation will be sufficient to get rid of that particular film of dirt, of dust that collected on the soul. 
But what we're about to say is, what if it's more malignant than that? What if it's more malicious than that? What if it's not just a matter of a person speaking meaningless conversation? What if a person is speaking negatively? Then what happens? Do you think that the Kafa Keller is going to do the trick? Apparently not. So, if you are on page 34, as page 34, it's like almost exactly in the middle of the page. Um, yeah, almost exactly in the middle of the page. The first word on the page is the word, uh, on the line, I'm sorry, is the word Bishalach. And we're straight after the full stop. You see where that is? Got it? Page 34, halfway down the page, the first line, uh, word on the line is Bishalach, and then you go after the full stop. Okay? Got it. All right. What will happen to the soul of a person who engaged during their lifetime in forbidden talk? What's forbidden talk? I, I'm absolutely certain. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you say forbidden talk? What? Lashon Hora. Exactly. That's what everybody thinks. And, and not incorrectly. Because Lashon Hara is one of the worst ways of speaking that a person can ever engage in. <laughs> Lashon Hara is where we, we focus on and we share negative things about another person. And by the way, in order for something to qualify as Lashon Hara, it has to be factual. It has to be true. If it's not true, it's not Lashon Hara. If it's not true, then it's liable. It's what we call Moitzi Shemra, which is in a certain regard worse than Lashon Hara because now you're making up a story about somebody. So typically, the very first thing, any time that a Jewish person thinks about forbidden speech, what comes to mind? Lashon Hora. That's why it's so interesting that the first example that the Alter Rebbe will give over here is not Lashon Hora. So, let's say that a person engages in forbidden talk. What is forbidden talk? Going, the first example that he gives is Leitzonus. Leitzonus. Now, unfortunately, most of the time, people understand the word leitzonus like the word leitzan. What's a leitzan in, in modern Hebrew? It is a clown. So most people understand leitzonus to mean somebody who clowns around. And when the Torah doesn't say that that's a problem. What, you're not allowed to, I mean, obviously it's not, <laughs> you don't anticipate that the Torah will expect us or encourage us to be silly. So clowning around it's not exactly something you expect it's going to happen, you know, with a Torah's blessing. But by the same token, the Torah doesn't, doesn't outlaw it. It said, listen, you want to be immature, be immature. It doesn't say outright, thou shalt not be a clown. So how then does thou ever call us devarim asurim, something which is forbidden? So let's understand it a little differently. Leitzonus, a better translation of the word leitzonus in the context of Torah is cynicism or scoffing so the late the person who's a clown really what they do is they make everything else into a joke it's one thing to 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 joke about things that are meaningless late sonus is where a person takes things that are meaningful and acts as though they're meaningless makes makes light of them, is dismissive, is cynical, is scoffs at things. That's definitely forbidden. So let's say for argument's sake, and I, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but if you have had this experience, you'll know that it's a really frustrating experience. Let's say that you've, you're in a particular context and you have the opportunity to inspire somebody. Whatever, let's, whatever it is. Let's say it's a particular gathering. Let's say you were invited to speak somewhere. Let's say that it's an interaction. It's a social get-together. Whatever it is. And you have the opportunity to inspire people. And let's just say that the way that you want to inspire people is you've got this very moving story that has a powerful message, a powerful moral. So you want to share this story with the crowd in order to be able to inspire them. Now, the way that this is going to work is you need people to come with you on this journey because that's the, the beauty of, that's the magic of storytelling. If you really know how to tell a story, you take people with you on the journey and because you take them with you on the journey, 
they get to a point where they also start to feel emotional around the particular topic that you want to inspire them with, that you want to convey. So here, you're sitting in front of this particular group, or you're sitting, you're, sp you're standing up at a lecture, and you're giving a lecture, whatever the particular case might be. It could even be at your Shabbos table. Telling a story at your Shabbos table, and to you, it was a really moving story, and you believe that it's the kind of story that will move other people as well. Midway through the story, you've got some people now sitting on the edge of their seat. Somebody decides that it's an appropriate moment either to crack a joke, so maybe you say something in the story and as a result of that, this person chooses to pick out the word that you said and use it as the, the hook you know, for their particular joke that they want to tell. Or worse than that, the person makes some dismissive comment. So you've got this miracle story, for example, that you're telling and before you get to the punchline, somebody makes a cynical comment, uh, ah! Do you, who here believes that that really happened? Something along those lines. It deflates everything. You, you were building to a particular crescendo. You were looking to inspire people. You were going to touch people. And now somebody's come and they've literally burst the bubble. They've derailed the process. It's deeply frustrating. It's terribly frustrating. But worse than that, it's not just a matter about, you know, okay, so obviously as the individual who's trying to tell the story and whatever, it's obviously frustrating for you. But something far worse has happened over here because there was the potential for a whole group of people to have a meaningful, transformative, inspiring experience and that's been taken from them. They've been robbed of this because once somebody's planted that seed of doubt, that cynical perspective, it's very difficult for people not to have that in their heads. Why would the Alter Rebbe put this as the first type of inappropriate or forbidden way of talking? Because this cynical, sort of detached, scoffing attitude relates to the individual or the group of people that are considered to be the first and primary arch enemies of the Jewish nation, Amalek. Remember Amalek? Remember the fact that the Torah tells us Zohar Asher Asolacha Amalek that you have to remember what Amalek did to you, and therefore we have this obligation Timche Es Zeicher Amalek that we have to eradicate every last vestige of what Amalek is. Well, what did Amalek do that was so bad? The Egyptians were the ones who made us slaves. The Pelishtim were the ones who attacked us multiple times in the course of of our history. What did Amalek do that was so radically different to all the other nations? And the answer is nothing really. Amalek didn't actually do anything differently. What's unique about Amalek is when and how Amalek did what everybody else does. So everybody else attacked us at some point in time. Okay, fine. So everybody else attacked us. How Amalek attacked us? When Amalek attacked us? That's the real chap. That's what differentiates Amalek from everybody else. So what did Amalek do? The Torah tells us, that Amalek ambushed you on the way as you were leaving Egypt. And Rashi makes an intriguing comment and it's very insightful. Rashi tells us, that as the Jewish people were leaving Egypt, the rest of the region was literally shuddering. In fact, we know this information because 40 years later when Joshua sends his spies to Israel and they go speak to Rachav, who becomes their contact person in Jericho, which is the first city that they're going to conquer, she tells them that even now, 40 years later, people are still trembling with the thought that the Jews are coming because they had such a decisive victory over the Egyptians who were the superpower at the time. And then they had the miracle of the splitting of the sea. It, it, it boggled everybody's minds. How can you even touch these people? How can you ever confront these people? How is it, ever, how's it even possible? Comes along Amalek and says, meh. What's the fuss? Who cares? So Rashi says that it's like a marshal of this boiling hot bath 
and everybody's too afraid of the water that they're going to be scalded by the water. And then you get one Meshuggah who says, no, don't worry, I'll jump in and you'll see. It's not as hot as everybody thinks. And that's the hint in the word Korcha, Asha Korcha Baderich, that he ambushed, or that Amalek ambushed us on the way out of Egypt, is also from the word Kar, which means cold. There was this great passion and enthusiasm and excitement and fear in some quarters about the Jews leaving Egypt and all the miracles. And here comes Amalek and he pours cold water over the whole thing. So what's the first kind of forbidden speech that the Alter Rebbe talks about? Leitzonus, the Amalek way of talking. Eh, please, do me a favor, it's exaggerated. I'm sure that's not what happened. Can anybody corroborate the story? Yeah, I think you're making too much of a fuss about it. I'll never forget once having a, a, a particular conversation with somebody who had a very serious medical scare, very serious health scare. And, we, you know, what do you do when a, when a person has a health scare? You know, you check mezuzahs and do various spiritual things to try and, you know, shift the energy and make sure that, that nothing negative emerges. So this person did all of that. And in the space of three days of checking mezuzahs and doing whatever, they had to go back for the, the full screening that was going to verify the particular health scare that, had, that the doctor had picked up. And everything was gone. It was absolutely clear. Absolutely clear. So I said to this person, you've you got to tell people your story. This is unbelievable. You know, look, look, look what's just happened. You had this amazing miracle that just happened in front of your, uh, in front of your eyes. And the person says, what do you mean? The doctors made a mistake the first time. Right? Late on us. And I, I, what are you getting so crazy about that it's some kind of a miracle and it's supernatural and it's prayer and it's mezuzahs? Science is fallible. Doctors made a mistake. So that's the first category of forbidden speech that the Alter Rebbe is going to uh, address over here. And then it gets to one that we know, so to speak, better, Losh and Hora. So page 34, and it's just over halfway down the page. Ve Losh and Hora, okay, obviously we know Losh and Hora is, is a, a, a very toxic way of speaking. Losh and Hora is where a person peddles the negative information or news about another person. And again, as I mentioned before, it's Dafka accurate. It's factual information. Okay, so what's so terrible about that? You're sharing information. That is true. It's not like you, you fabricated a story about somebody. Why is that so objectionable? And the answer is because any time that a person shares and precipitates negativity about a particular person, it consolidates that negativity. That becomes like inescapable for them because now that's how they are defined in, in the society. And that's how they're defined in their own mind. And this is what people say about me. In fact, just the other day, I met somebody, this was, it was such an, an incredible insight into the power of Lashon Hora. So I met somebody the other day who told me that, they had, uh, that, that we had met once before, years ago. I do not recall that. And they said that for many years they've avoided me because they were absolutely certain that somebody who had been spreading rumors about them would have shared those rumors with me. And they were so embarrassed by the rumors, they didn't want to have to, like, so to speak, con confront the rabbi, you know, knowing that I might know this about them. Now, as it happens, those rumors never reached me. I, I never heard this about the person. But can you imagine somebody who lived with that particular guilt and that's, that view of themselves for years, it must be at least a decade, because somebody was speaking badly about them. Lashon Hore is not that we are spreading falsehoods about a person. Lashon Hore is that we're creating a reality for that person that they are locked into their negativity, that they don't have a way out. That's a, it's like a fascinating thought. So let's say that a person engages in improper talk, whether it's Leitzonos, whether it's, Leitz, whether it's Lashon Hora, Ve Ka Yoitse Bohem, or other types of speaking which are obviously not allowed according to the Torah. Uh, that would include things like falsehood, it would include, like we spoke about this last time, right? Profanities, etc., etc. Shehein Misholish Kripes Atmeyois Legamre. Now we're dealing with a scenario where a person is speaking the type of talk. That is a hundred percent clipper. It is absolutely antithetical to, to Judaism. This is not now some kind of a thin layer of dust because there was some meaningless prattle that became part of their neshama's reality. This is a stain. This is a stubborn stain. 
It's not going to be so easy to remove. Says the Alter Rebbe, Ein kafakela levadoi mo'il letaher ulahaver tum osoy me'anefesh. The kafakela slingshot experience that we spoke about previously, which we said would help the person who is uneducated and therefore spend so much time talking so-called nonsense, this would help to cleanse them, is not going to be sufficient for the person who's actually speaking really toxic speech. Why not? Because there's a pegam, there's a blemish on their neshama. Any time that a person does something that is involved in the world of Klippa, they stain their own soul. So if somebody engages in something which is just of no value, of no content, they just talk nonsense, okay, so something attached to the soul and you kind of shake it out. Shake it out, you smack it around a little bit and you get rid of it. But if a person does something that stains the soul, then we're going to have to start scrubbing and applying heat and pressure in order to get rid of it. Says the Alter Rebbe, Rak In order for this neshama to be able to cleanse itself of these negative conversations, the neshama is going to have to go into Gehenna. Okay, what's Gehenna? What's Gehenna? So, most people have this blur between Gehenna and what the conventional thinking outside of Judaism calls hell. That's what most people think. So most people have a picture in their mind that if a soul is going to go into Gehenna, first thing that they picture is the soul is going down. That's the first thing. So it's like, I don't know exactly what picture you have in your mind. It might be a picture of, you know, standing over there in front of the pearly gates, like in the cartoons, you know, and you're standing on a cloud and then there's two gates. I've never understood the cartoons because they just have the two gates. But then there's no walls or anything, so why do you have to go through the gates, Bichlal? Okay, but I guess you can't really ask uh, Talmudic questions on a cartoon. Or perhaps you have a picture in your mind of some kind of an elevator, so you can go up to the, to the penthouse, to Gan Eden, or you can go down into the basement, into Gehenna. So that's the first perception that people have is that Gan Eden and Gehenna are two completely extreme, distant places. One on the one end and the other on the other end of the spectrum. Part of that misconception is that it's up versus down. The other misconception that people have is that it's punitive. It's a place where people go to be punished. And that's a really, really important shift that we've, we've got to change. Children at a certain age go out, play outside. They bring back half the outside with them when they return back into the house. So they, you know, sometimes you don't even know if it's your child who's come back in because there's so much mud and dirt and grime and whatever gives you. You don't know who this person is. They run about the same height and the same body. Uh, you know, okay, it's probably my kid. So the child goes out to play in the mud. Now the child comes back inside. What's the first thing, of course, that the mother says? Got to take a bath. When a child is at that age that they are frolicking in the mud outside, they very often feel that taking a bath is a punishment. Why do I have to take a bath? It's not fair. I took a bath already last night. Why do I have to take a bath tonight? I don't like to take a bath. And if I'm going to take a bath, I'm going to have to, I'm going to clean myself. Don't come along and start scrubbing and behind the ears and all these things. Just leave me alone. I just sort of go in. You know, can I have something to entertain me in the bath? They, they see the whole process as some kind of a punishment. How does the parent see the, the process of, of bathing their child, their, their muddy child? The parent sees it much, much simpler. There's dirt. We have to get rid of it. The only way to get rid of the dirt is you've got to take a bath. And unfortunately, it's not going to be sufficient just to sit in there and soak. You're going to have to actually do some mechanical labor. You know? You're going to have to actually scrub some things and move things around. That's what you're going to have to do to clean up. You don't have a choice. It's not a punishment. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's a punishment. So what is Gehenna? Gehenna is a spiritual process that Hashem devised 
to allow us the technology that can get rid of the stains, the dirt, the stubborn stains that our neshama has picked up through its journey in life. Is it comfortable? Not necessarily. Is it something that a person's going to volunteer for? Yeah, pick me. You know, I, I want to go to Gehenna. No, not necessarily. Although, although they say that if a person is wise, possibly the Dafka would want to go to Gehenna because a person who's mature enough and wise enough is going to say, you know what? I want to be clean. What's more important? To be comfortable to be clean. I want to be clean. Okay, fine. Put me in Gehenna. But the whole, pr pro the whole process and the whole principle of Gehenna is not a punitive process. It's not like Hashem is out to get us. Ha ha ha, you know, I'm going to hand you over to the devil and he's going to toast and roast you. And that's how, you know, because we're going to show you that you behaved badly in your life and now is the opportunity for vengeance. I mean, there are other theologies that believe that kind of thing. And not only that, that shockingly enough, they believe that it's going to be, you know, forever. Eternal damnation, you know. That's how they, that's how they understand it. That's, uh, once, you, once you get shafted into the world of Gehenna, that's it. That's where you stay until who knows what. Gehenna is something completely different. Gehenna is a tremendous chesed. It's a tremendous favor that Hashem does for us. Because it allows the neshama to come out better. It allows the neshama to rehabilitate. It allows the neshama to upgrade. That's a tremendous chesed. But why would a person need Gehenna? Because the person has a stain on their neshama. The stain is created by engagement with something which is klipa, which is antithetical to Judaism, which is an interference between us and Hashem. Gehenna is designed to do the difficult work of getting rid of that thing that's in the way of my relationship with Hashem. That's not a punishment. That is the opposite of a punishment. Hashem is saying there's a blockage between us. So now we're going to get rid of that blockage. Got to do a face uh, ultrasound or laser or whatever it is to break down the kidney stone. You know, that, that's what we've got to be doing over here. There's a blockage. There's an interference. And we have to devise a method that's going to shatter that blockage and allow the connection again. That is Gehenna. What Alter Rebbe has shown us over here is that if a person experiences a lesser kind of impurity, then they need a less invasive way to clean it. The dust, the kafakela, shake the neshama around a little bit until the dust comes off. But if, God forbid, a person engages in a deeper, more toxic kind of a negative experience, like speaking Lash and Hora, etc., those are the examples that we're using over here, then the neshama is going to require a proper, so to speak, almost like a hammering, you know, it's a, it's a scrub. Somebody's going to have to get involved. It's going to require heat. It's going to require pressure. It's going to require friction. And that will free the neshama of this particular blockage. Vechein. Now, bearing in mind that we're speaking at the moment in the genre of, uh, of, of speaking. So we're talking about various ways that a person could talk that would interfere with their relationship with Hashem. Vechein, likewise, so again, just in the book on page 34, now at the next full stop, which is about four lines down from where we started this evening. Here's another scenario. Again, it might be a little bit of an uncomfortable scenario because unfortunately this is something which happens to us fairly regularly, probably much more regularly than we would like to admit. Mi she'ef shaloi lasek batoira. Let's say that there's a person who has the, uh, the opportunity to learn Torah. Okay, pause. What does that mean we have the opportunity to learn Torah? Well, first of all, it means that we have a functional brain. <laughs> okay. Nobody said that we have to learn the deepest secrets or the most complex Talmudic passages. There are many different parts of Torah. And some parts of Torah are particularly accessible. You could read a Midrash on the parasha. You could just read the parasha itself. It's very accessible. So, Let's say that a person has the opportunity to engage in Torah learning. Now, of course, the second thing that you would need in order to have the opportunity to engage in Torah learning is you'd need the time. 
So if, for example, you're doing something that the Torah endorses, like earning a living, looking after your health, eating, sleeping, you can't be held accountable for the fact that you're not learning Torah during those times because the Torah says that's what you've got to do. The Torah says you've got to sleep. The Rambam says you've got to sleep eight hours, right? which doesn't uh, necessarily seem to be as popular in the modern world as it used to be. And the Torah says that you have to eat. In fact, there's a mitzvah. If you want to be able to bench, you have to be able to eat to the point of being satisfied. That means you've got to eat more than once a day. Pas Shachritz, the Gemara, talks about the value of having a decent breakfast, a wholesome breakfast that will help you get through the day. Earn a living? Yes, you've got to earn a living. The Gemara tells us that there were two schools of thought about how a Jewish person is supposed to earn. And the one school of thought was, very, was a really radical perspective. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai says, learn Torah all day and God will take care of the rest. The Gemara says, not everybody can do that. In fact, it says, most people cannot. What? Most people have to go and work. So there, there's, no, there's no issue with a person who's not learning Torah right now because they're engaged in a kosher business or looking after their health or whatever. But you know what the problem is? The problem is free time. Because it's probably fair to say that there has never in history ever been a society with so much free time. Now, of course, if you had to speak to people in today's society, they would contest that and say, what do you mean? We don't have free time. Where's our free time? We're so busy. We're run off our feet. We're completely sugar. We're crazy. We're overwhelmed. We're overloaded. Yeah. You know why? Because we are also obsessed with filling our free time with all kinds of stuff, much of which isn't necessary. You know, in the old days, people worked in order to feed themselves. They didn't work in order to, to have uh, massive assets that they, they would earn interest from or investments or whatever. Because, you know, people didn't schlep around a hina hair back and forth a million times a day. You went to wherever you had to go in the morning. You stayed there till you had to come home in the afternoon. That, that was simple. People didn't run to social engagements every night. Oh, tonight I've got to be at this one, and tomorrow I've got to be at that one. I've got this, and I have two events on the same night. They didn't have these problems. And more than anything else, and I know it sounds a little overstated because we talk about it all the time, they did not have the technologies that rob us of our time. That they did not have. So it might have started with a printing press where suddenly people had the leisure of reading. So instead of going to sleep at night, the person would sit there, they would read Shakespeare. <laughs> I don't know what they used to read in those days, the early novels. That subsequently evolved into something even more mind-destroying, because reading at least is stimulating, you know, at least, at least it's got an intellectual component to it. But then they introduced this thing called the TV. And suddenly you have a reality where people were able to kill hours at a time. Hours at a time, sitting in front of a screen, just simply, you know, vegetating. There was a study I once read that said that there are less active brain waves while the person watches TV than while they're sleeping. So, what does that tell you, you know? But in the old days, in the old days, what was TV already? TV was a thing that sat in one room in the house came on at a certain time, went off at a certain time. And in the time that it was on, you had uh, one choice, two choices, maybe four choices at some point. But today, the TV goes with us wherever we go. <coughs> Everywhere. In the, in the living room, in the bedroom, in the in shul, wherever you want, there, there it is, the, set, the screen, with unlimited unlimited opportunity to swallow our time. So when you read this line, somebody who has the capacity, the opportunity to learn Torah, you, gotta lie, you cannot read, I'm sorry, I don't think anybody could read this line without gulping. The opportunity to learn Torah? Have we ever stopped to calculate how much opportunity we have to learn Torah? You know what would happen? It's like they always say, if, uh, if, a, if everybody in the Jewish community would give the 10% to tzedakah that we're required to give, we would have no welfare issues in the Jewish community. And that, I'm sure that's factual. 
Because even people who give tremendous amounts of tzedakah don't necessarily know the principle of 10%. So what they're giving might look a lot on a balance sheet, but it's actually not a lot relative to the mitzvah. Same concept. If every one of us would take 10% of the time that we spend in mindless activities, or let's make it even more specific. If we would take 10% of the time that we spend staring at a screen, 10% of that time, and convert that into Torah learning, I guarantee you within a year, we would be further in our Judaism than we've probably been in the last decade. So it's, I, I, I find that it's impossible to read this phrase, Ef Shaloi Lasik Batoira, without being shaken. You, you have the opportunity to learn Torah. It's not like the old days where we're running away, away from the Cossacks. Or there's no such concept as being able to read a book because the books were expensive. Or if you wanted to hear from a good teacher, you had to travel for weeks in order to go to that good teacher. We don't have any of those impediments. We have all the time in the world, if we're honest. To me, this is like... We could be learning Torah. Imagine we got it right 10% of the time. Says the Alter Rebbe, let's say that there's an individual that who could be learning Torah, but instead, instead of learning Torah, the person engages in meaningless activities. Raise your hand if you live in the 21st century. Instead of learning Torah, Meaningless activities. Memes, Netflix, sport, I don't know. You know it, 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 to me, this like shakes us to the core. So he's going to tell us that that kind of an ashama, when it reaches the other end of, uh, of the, the, the experience, when it crosses the threshold into the next world, that neshama is going to need some serious rehabilitation. Because as, uh, as they say, and the Rebbe would frequently quote this, time is an Aveda she'eno choizeres. Time is a, it's a, an asset, it's a commodity that can never be reclaimed. Can never get back the time. So he's going to tell us that there's a very unique rehabilitation process for such an ashama. I actually thought we'd get that far this evening that we could actually go into the detail of it. But I, 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 don't, I didn't realize we're, we're kind of out of time. So we'll have to pick that up next week, please God, and learn about another kind of a Gehenna that most people have never heard of in their lives, which is the required process to rehabilitate an Ashama that didn't do what it could have done when it had the opportunity. You'll see, it's going to be a very fascinating thing, but we'll, we'll have to leave it for next time.